Shabbat Shalom, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Well, we're asking the Lord to bless us this morning as we worship Him, to give Him the praise. We're asking the Lord to be in this house this morning. Amen? So if you all want to stand, we're going to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And for those who are watching on the live stream, we want to welcome you in as well. And it's good to have my wife back. So thank you for being here and singing with us. So let us do this. Let us sing out to the Lord this morning and give him praise. Amen. Clap your hands.
Good morning. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Let's do the Shema and the candle lighting. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kideshanu Onete Emuna, Beyeshua HaMashiach, Or HaOlam, Ushemo Hanu Malikin, Haner Shel Shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through faith in Yeshua the Messiah, the light of the world. And in his name we kindle the Sabbath lights. And a king shall come forth from the sons of Yeshai, and from his descendants the Messiah shall be anointed, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Amen. Now the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ekat. Baruch Shem Kavod, Malkuto Leolam Vayet. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. being a part of Beth Ariel this morning and worshiping with us. And Chaya, we really appreciate your leading us in the Shema, leading us in the light, in the blessing to God as we uh, light the candles. So nice job. How's everyone doing today? It's really wonderful. Those of you watching online on the East Coast, we are praying for you. We're thinking about you anyway. I think my son said, Mary Lou will correct me, but I think it was like five degrees out in... Uh, in, in Connecticut. Largemont, was it five degrees too? Yeah, yeah, I know on top of Mount Washington, you know, I think that's the tallest mountain on the East Coast in the uh, Appalachian Trail. You know, you go on up and you come into New Hampshire, Washington, Mount Washington. I think they had below zero 100. It says the coldest on record they've ever had uh, up there. But here we are. And uh, it's <laughs> we shift real quick. Here we are, and it's like 70 degrees, so it's, uh, it's really beautiful, isn't it? So Shabbat Shalom. It's wonderful to have you here. If you ha have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 12. While you're turning, let me just welcome those of you watching online. Thank you for tuning in, being a part of Beth Ariel online with us this morning. If you're ever here in the Southern California area, Los Angeles, come on down on a Saturday, 11 o'clock, at the Lindley Church on Lindley Avenue, 5901 Lindley Avenue here in Tarzana. I'd love to have you come out. And then every Saturday evening, we're up in Santa Clarita, up in Valencia, 6 o'clock, at Restoration Church at 23670 Wiley Canyon Road. Love to have you up there as well. So let me mention a couple of things that are going on. You know, we've got Joshua Aaron's going to be with us in concert, worship night with Joshua Aaron. How many of you have checked him out online, have gone to YouTube? He's amazing, isn't he? He's really terrific. He's really wonderful. Uh, he's sort of, I think, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. Uh, during periods of revival, during periods of uh, where God's word just begins to uh, permeate a given society. God has always had key uh, speakers, you know, like the John Wesleys back in the 18th century, the Billy Grahams in the 20th century, and uh, and there's always been accompanying musicians. And right now, you know, especially in the Jewish world, the guys that were big in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they're sort of getting older, and now the younger crop is coming up, and Joshua Aaron is among them. So we have him up at our Valencia uh, location at, uh, at uh, Restoration Church, 
Tuesday night, September the 21st. It is a free concert, so everyone can just come and love to have you. Uh, our problem, our challenge is space. So up there we can sit, I'm hoping seat about 250 or so, and that may be stretching things. So the doors will open at 6.30, first come, first serve. Uh, after that, it'll be like standing room. And I know that I've already received upwards of around 80 folks have written telling me they're coming. One person is flying in from Houston. I want to see him so, so badly. I'm sure that there are others that I don't know of. Uh, I did get a few other calls asking me for hotels in the area. So I'm telling you, you know, those of you watching online, those of us here, uh, if this is something you want to do, just make sure that you get up there uh, in time to get, a, uh, to get a seat. We'll take like a free will offering afterwards, but um, this is a real... And um, we're, we'll be, we're encouraging people to invite their Jewish friends, Jewish believer. Uh, he'll be sharing his faith as well through music, through song, through testimony. So that's Tuesday evening, September the 21st. Uh, February. What did I just say? September. September. <laughs> September. That's, why, that's why I love this congregation. They're not afraid to just speak their minds, you know. Um, I mean, there have been some that are saying, Gary, man, it's getting too long, you know, like, let's do it. Um, okay, so it's Tuesday night, February the 21st. That's the day after President's Day, 7 o'clock up at Restoration Church, 23670 Wiley Canyon Road. So I hope we'll all see you there. Now, that's February. March, <laughs> I was going to say October. No, so March, <laughs> March 4th is a Saturday, and we'll be celebrating Purim all together. Our congregants here, we're not going to have a Saturday morning service in Tarzana. We're all going to go on up to uh, Valencia. We do it here, but we just don't have the room. So we're going to all go up to Valencia, and we'll have our Purim service with our Valencia folks, our Tarzana folks, and everyone else that wants to come. We're going to do some uh, mailings. We want to get some Jewish people to uh, celebrate with us. We're going to have special kids stuff, you know, dress up, um, and prizes for the uh, j just got to wear costumes. You know, we would say the best costume, but I, I'm not a, a harsh judge. I'm a very easy judge. So we'll have prizes for the kids and stuff. We want to make it a kids-focused event. We'll have our noisemakers. We'll be reading a little bit from the book of, of Esther. We'll have the kids there. So that's going to be Saturday, March the 4th, up in uh, Valencia. And uh, now, after service... Don't run out. I have a special announcement I want to make just before we all uh, head on over for a nosh over at, a, at our dining hall. So we'll have our service. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We'll worship God. And then I want to make a, a special announcement uh, to us. In May, by the way, May the 13th, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves, but May 13th is a Saturday. 14th is Israel's Independence Day. So we're going to come together to celebrate Israel's Independence Day on Saturday, May 13th. We'll bring both of our congregations together. We'll meet up at, at Valencia since we'll have the room to do that. So I think it's going to be, uh, we've got some really exciting things uh, coming up here in 2023, especially to reach out to our Jewish friends and neighbors. I just looked on, on the calendar. Uh, I mean, coming into September, Rosh Hashanah is like a Friday night. So our Saturday service, will celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur is a Sunday night. Uh, Sukkot will cover a Saturday. Simchat Torah is on a Saturday. So we've got a lot of great uh, times com coming up. And then during the summer, when we always have our immersion services, we'll be meeting again. Last year, we met over at the Hicks's and had our service outside in his yard. We're going to be doing stuff like that this summer. So just to give you an idea of where we're headed as we want to continue to worship God together and reach out to our, uh, to our Jewish friends. Now, I ask you to turn uh, to Genesis chapter 12 because I want to focus. I meant to speak on this last week, but we had a special guest. We had uh, Ava came 
uh, Gay Ellen invited her friend, a Holocaust survivor. How many of you were here last Saturday? Most of you, I'm sure. Wasn't she wonderful? I mean, she was like 91, is that, am I right about that? 90, 91 years old. She was as lucid and as together as you could imagine. She told her story. And I think the thing that impressed me the most was she held that microphone the whole time. You know, I mean, she just held and she was uh, sharing with us her experience in Germany and in France. And uh, it was really quite an amazing story to, uh, to hear. I wanted to piggyback a little bit on that, even as we've been speaking about our Jewish, our Jewish people, uh, particularly with respect to the whole issue of Israel's endurance and perseverance and contribution to uh, world history, really. But her endurance and her uh, perseverance as a sign of God's blessing, but also a, a sign of uh, God's existence. So y you may be familiar with this. I was reading recently a, uh, a book review that was written by Professor Sarnar. He's a professor of Jewish studies at Brandeis University. And in that book review, he made just a, a couple of comments that were relevant to what I want to share with you this morning. He tells us that at a given period of time, I forget the year, I think it was in the 18th century, King Frederick, who was the king of Prussia, uh, he asked his ministers, he gathered them around, and he said to his ministers, can you give me one single irrefutable proof for the existence of God? And uh, John, or Jean French, now, you know, I barely can speak English, but Jean-Baptiste du Boyer, the Marquis de Argans, is that how you pronounce it? A-R-G-E-N-S. Anybody know French here that can help me out? No. So we're all in the same boat. In any case, the Marquis, he replied, the Jews, your majesty, the Jews. Yeah, that's really kind of a telling statement. Can you give me one irrefutable proof for the existence of God? And one of his ministers tells him, Look at the Jewish people and what God has done through them over, over the centuries. As years went on, uh, histories of the Jews began to be published. So in the 18th century, there were a number of books. There was one by another French, uh, French writer, Protestant historian, in 1706. He wrote a volume, a multi-volume on the history of the Jewish people, 1706, History of the Jewish People, and he wrote this. Uh, he said, through a study of Jewish history, Christians, that's who he was writing it for, Christians could learn that the Jews were a people, quote, despised, hated, persecuted by all nations. 1706, he's writing this. Still distinguished in their laws, customs, Faith remaining, he said, a standing evidence of divine vengeance upon unbelief and an indelible monument of the truth of the God of the scriptures. Is that kind of a st telling statement as well? That a study of Jewish history will provide one, one, will provide one with that irrefutable evidence for the existence of God. Centuries later, that's the 18th century, 19th century, more histories of the Jewish people began to be written. Now some were being written by uh, other Christians. Two were referred to as popular Christian surveys of Jewish history. I have one uh, on my, uh, in my library by uh, Milman. He was an Englishman. And he also reiterated that a study of Jewish history would only lead one to the conclusion that the God of the Bible is the God of the universe. Now, in the 20th century, Cecil Roth, Jewish man, Jewish historian, he wrote his history, what was entitled the History of the Jews. And his point was that Israel's or the Jewish people's existence through their persecution and struggles 
was uh, an indication, he spoke it, of it as a special people whom God uh, has sustained uh, throughout their, their existence. Now, <clears throat> I had read this at an, another period of time. I had written this in just a, among a number of my notes. But there was a Russian historian and philosopher. He wrote a book called The Meaning of History back in 1936. He had become a believer, but as a communist, as a Russian uh, historian, he wrote, I remember, he said, how the materialist interpretation of history, when I attempted in my youth to verify it, that is the materialist's interpretation of history, which according to uh, materialism was the survival of the fittest, right? That's what Marxism was all about, the survival of the fittest. So he was saying as he was reflecting on history and the, as a Russian, as a communist, uh, the understanding of history through a materialistic frame of reference, he said, when I attempted in my youth to verify this approach, the survival of the fittest, by applying it to the destinies of the people, it broke down in the case of the Jews, where destiny seemed absolutely inexplicable from the materialistic standpoint. Because if it's the survival of the fittest, the Jewish people being the most highly persecuted people throughout history, you would expect that they wouldn't survive. But he writes... According to the materialist criterion, this people ought long ago to have perished. Its survival is a mysterious and wonderful phenomenon, demonstrating that the life of this people is governed by a special predetermination, transcending the processes of adaptation expounded by the materialistic interpretation of history. The survival of the Jews, their endurance under absolutely peculiar conditions, and the fateful role played by them in history, all these point to the peculiar and mysterious foundations of their destiny. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, they don't want to say a living God. They just speak about a mysterious, peculiar, <laughs> you know, uh, could you elaborate on what that means? And then I share with you Mark Twain's comment, right, uh, that he wrote when he concluded his essay entitled Concerning the Jews. And I'll just read it because it's one of those uh, very poignant statements. He said, he, meaning the Jew, could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed, made a vast noise, and they're all gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? You have to at least give these persons credit for speaking the truth, even if they cannot provide for us the answer. But the answer to this peculiar, peculiar mysterious uh, predetermination that the Russian historian spoke of, the, uh, the uh, question, the secret of his immortality uh, can be answered right from, from the scripture. So I asked us to turn to Genesis chapter 12. Now, as you know, I was discipled among those that had invested their lives in my own understanding of God's word was uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. 
And early on in my association with him back in the 70s, I used to go with him when he would speak. I used to go with him sometimes when he would speak at various churches. Couldn't get enough of God's word. I used to meet with him in his office uh, every other week. Mary Lou and I used to go up to his home when he was living in New City, New York, up in Rockland County. And twice a week, uh, twice a month, we'd go over to his home and we'd study the word with him and others that joined us. And then when he would speak out at various churches, if I could, I'd go with him and just to listen to him speak. And I heard a message that he had presented on Genesis chapter 12, uh, over and over and over again. So much so that one time I said, Arnold, let me be you and I can deliver this message. I tell you, I know this message. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think so. But um, I remember, I, I couldn't do it today, but I remember in his presentation on the continued perseverance and endurance of the Jewish people based on God's promise that he makes here. We'll look at it in a moment. In Genesis chapter 12, he introduced his message by stating when he was in college, and most of us that attended college, uh, this will resonate with us. When he was in college, he had a number of different classes on philosophy, on history. And he said one class that he had was on the history of philosophy. And basically, the class surveyed various key historic philosophers throughout time. So they studied, you know, the Socrateses and the, and, uh, the Aristotles and the Platos and all the way up into modern time. And then he had a segment of a history class, which was entitled not a history of philosophy, but a philosophy of history. And he said that when you looked at a philosophy of history, now you weren't looking at individual historic figures and how they came to understand history, but now you looked at various principles that these philosophers had unearthed, had come up with, so as to understand how history manifests itself. So it's sort of like overarching principle by which one could understand where history has come from and where history is going. And he said the Bible contains a philosophy of history. That is to say, the Bible contains a principle by which all of history can be understood. And he said that philosophy of history is found in Genesis chapter 12 in the first three verses. So let's take a look at this. In chapter 12, God says to Abraham, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, And him who dishonors you or curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he said God's philosophy of history. We could say that because these are God's words. Or we could say the Bible's philosophy of history is that God will bless those individuals, those nations that bring blessing upon God's people, and God will curse, bring judgment, oppose, go to war with, become the enemy of those who would bring cursing upon God's people. He said that is God's philosophy of history. And then he took us on a survey of how that manifested itself throughout biblical history and then into modern times. And so we mentioned, for example, and we're not going to look at it, but in chapter 12, you can read that right after Abraham makes it into the promised land, the land that God would show him, a famine comes into the land, and Abraham takes his wife and leaves the land of promise and goes to Egypt. And when he goes to Egypt, Pharaoh sees Sarah, sees her as a beautiful woman, 
and takes her to be his wife. God then reveals to Pharaoh that he's become the enemy of God and God will bring judgment upon him for taking the wife of his servant Abram. This happens on two occasions in Abraham's life and in both occasions the same thing happens. God forewarns that individual even though that individual didn't do anything wrong. In this instance, Abraham lied, said she's my sister because he was afraid Pharaoh would take his life. So Pharaoh didn't do anything wrong. But God's promise was, doesn't matter whether you know or don't know. It's sort of like a traffic stop. You know, if you say, I didn't know he's supposed to stop at a stop sign. Didn't know it, just learning it. Well, ignorance of the law is no uh, is no excuse. And so the ticket's written out. So ignorance of God's philosophy of history is no excuse. Judgment will ensue as well as will blessing if blessing is brought to bear. In fact, in one instance in the book of Luke, it's very interesting that the elders of the Jewish people go to Yeshua. They're not even believers in him, but they go to Yeshua. And they speak in behalf of a Roman centurion. And the Roman centurion is desirous of, I think it is, uh, his child to be healed. And the elders go to the Roman centurion, uh, go, to, go to Yeshua, and they say to him, this Roman centurion is deserving of your blessing. And the reason is, he loves the nation, is the phrase that's used in the gospel. He loves the nation, and he built us a synagogue. He brought blessing upon us, and therefore, by right, blessing should be brought to him. And so Arnold went on to show how this manifests itself in blessing and in cursing throughout the Bible. You can look at Pharaoh in the story of the Exodus. You can look at Haman in the story of Esther, and we'll look at that in, in March. And you could look in history, in world history, that occurs outside of biblical history. Now, I want to take us in a little bit of a different direction. But notice in, go back to Genesis chapter 12. Notice this. This is kind of cool. I hadn't noticed this before. But five times, God uses the word blessing or bless in these verses. Let's look at it again. In verse 1, he says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. Here it is. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So five times he mentions the word blessing. Now, keep in mind, Moses is writing this, right? Moses is the author of the first five books. So he's choosing to record for us, as God has made known to him, what was stated. So five times he records God making reference to the blessing promise. Now, if we were to go back in the book of Genesis up to chapter 12, chapters 1 to 11, which is a main section of the book of Genesis. It should not surprise us, but it did surprise me. Five times the word blessing is used by Moses in chapters 1 to 11. So take, check this out. Look at chapter 1 at the creation account. When you look at chapter 1, verse 22... Let's go back to verse 20. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Verse 21, so God created the great sea creatures and every living thing. Verse 22, and God blessed them. It's the first time the word blessing occurs. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on earth. Now, if you go down to verse 20, 26, then it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock. Now go down to verse 28. And God blessed them 
And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. That's the second time the word blessing is used. Now, turn to Genesis chapter 2. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, or thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, verse 2, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. And then look at verse 3. So God blessed. It's the third time the word blessing occurs. So God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, 28, now chapter 2, verse 3. Now turn over to chapter 5. This is the book of the generation of Adam. Verse 1, when God created man, he made him in his likeness. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, that's the fourth time, and named them Adam, man, when they were created. And then if you turn to chapter 9, And after the flood, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's the fifth time. So it's no accident that when we come to Abraham, we have a five-fold statement of blessing that is recited on Abraham. Why? Because when God created the world in Genesis chapter 1, his intention was for God's creation to receive the fullness of blessing that he had for it. Now, intuitively, we have a sense of what blessing means. But what does it really mean specifically? What does it mean to be blessed? And when we look at these five expressions, they all revolve around be fruitful and multiply. And so blessing means to be enlarged. To be expanded, to be increased, to be fruitful. In other words, blessing is sort of the, the extension or the extending of God's grace and mercy so as to enhance a person's life, so as to bring fulfillment to a person's life, so as to make one fruitful and multiplied in their life means the outpouring of God's goodness, which is what the creation account is, right? After each day, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. So blessing sort of a general term denoting the fullness of the goodness of God to be extended upon an individual or upon a nation. Now, Abraham gets the five-fold blessing because by Genesis chapter 3, sin has invaded the world. And by virtue of that sin, the blessing, the goodness, the unfolding of God's intention to enhance his creation in humanity is distorted. I don't want to say frustrated in the sense that God can't do anything about it because he can, but frustrated in the sense that the intention of the creation is not what God intended. He said to be fruitful and multiply, but also to have dominion, to have authority over, to have a sense of rulership. In other words, he's inviting humanity to join God in the rulership over his creation. But sin has frustrated that, has intercepted that, has sort of broken that opportunity for us. But God set in motion a means by which it could be restored. That promise is given in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman. The seed or descendant of the woman is Messiah, but he comes through a particular channel of people. He doesn't just appear on the scene, but he appears on the scene through a particular grid, a particular human grid. And that grid is seen or culminates in Abraham. 
Abraham is the continuation, you might say, although there are connecting links, but he's the continuation of that promise of the seed of the woman of Genesis 3.15. There are continuing links from uh, Gen Genesis 1 through Adam, through Seth, Noah, but ultimately culminating in Abraham. That's why he gets the five-fold statement of blessing to correspond to the five-fold statement of blessing in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, as I said before, Moses is the writer. Moses' life comes to an end in the book of Deuteronomy. So if we turn to the book of Deuteronomy, this is kind of interesting too. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 26, for example, or excuse me, well, we can look at 26 because it's here where Moses begins to highlight God's fuller intention through his people Israel. He's redeemed them from Egypt because there's a greater purpose through the people of Israel that he has for them. And he has the promised land to bring them to. So when he concludes chapter 26, he'll say something, well, he says this, look at verse 18. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people for his treasured possession. And he has promised you that you are to keep his commandments and that he will set you in praise and in fame and in honor high above all nations, all the Gentile nations, and that, that he has made and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. This is the channel through which and now as they're coming out of the wilderness, the desert, out of Egypt to enter into the promised land, he's putting before them the heightened responsibility they have and position they have. They're sort of like, as a nation, a parallel to Adam as the head of creation and as the descendant of Abraham. Now this nation rises above to be the conduit through which the blessing of God, which has been distorted, which has been frustrated, now God will begin to bring into reality once again. So then Moses, if you look at chapter 28, Moses then places before the people the blessing and the curse. Just as he said to Abraham, all nations that bless you will be blessed, all nations that curse you will be cursed. Now he says to his own people, I set before you blessing and cursing. And if they fail to submit to God's law and they choose to worship idols, they will receive the judgment of God. But if they choose to follow God, God will bring about the great blessing that is in store for them. Now, the reality of this will be seen when Yeshua returns and he saves his people from their sin. Romans eleven twenty five. all Israel shall be saved. When the deliverer shall come from Zion and turn away all ungodliness from Jacob, then they will fulfill this promise and be that fullest conduit for Messiah's reign and his glory. Remember what Messiah himself said, you will not see me anymore until you shall say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, until you shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel's the key to the return of Messiah, just as they have been the key to the first coming redemptive ministry of Messiah. And here, Moses now is laying this out. Remember, he's written these five books. He's told us of the five-fold blessing from Genesis 1 through Genesis 9. Then that five-fold statement of blessing rests on Abraham. Now look what Moses does as his life comes to an end and as Israel is prepared to enter the promised land. Look at verse 1 of uh, chapter 28. He says, If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Now catch this. And all these blessings, number one, 
shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessing, number two, shall you, shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Verse four, blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. Is that interesting? Now he sort of brings it to a conclusion with the sevenfold statement of blessing, seven being that number of completion and fullness, even as he brings to a climax the Torah, the first five books, the book of Deuteronomy now, as Israel gets ready to enter the land, and his encouragement is follow God so that that restorative blessing could rest upon you so that the blessing could cascade to the nations of the world. That's why he said to Abraham, we go back to Genesis 12, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, here's another thing I hadn't noticed before. If you look back at Genesis chapter 12, and you look at these first three verses again, if I'm not mistaken, I think it is 12 times in these three verses, he makes reference to Abraham. Notice what he does. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from, your, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. So that you will be a blessing, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The focus is Abraham, his descendants, the channel through which the ultimate blessing of God, the goodness of God, the fullness of God will come to uh, rest on God's creation and on the peoples of the earth. And, of course, the means by that which, of that will be through Messiah, the descendant of Abraham, who is the specific seed or offspring of Abraham, who will bring that into reality and to bring that into, uh, into, into fru fruition. It's just stunning. Now, if we keep that in mind, turn with me to the book of Revelation. So all these authors that we read have made the point of Israel's perseverance and their continued existence to be a mystery, a peculiar reality that we observe, a secret of immortality in the words of, of uh, Mark Twain. But the point is that Israel's perseverance is the question that was raised and God is saying the blessing on Israel and the blessing to the world rests or will come through the channel of his people, which necessitates their continued existence, which then makes sense as to why the enemy of God, the evil one, Satan, the dragon, referred to as the devil, would seek to destroy God's chosen people, and the reason why they have been the focus of such hatred throughout the course of their existence and why many have sought to destroy them. So if you look at Revelation chapter 12, John sees a great sign that appeared in the heaven. What does he see? He sees a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Well, this parallels Joseph's dream that he had, which would indicate that his mother and father and his 11 brothers would bow down to him because of his uh, position that he will be given 
as the right hand of Pharaoh. So this imagery is a throwback to what Joseph saw. So the 12 stars are the 12 tribes, uh, signify the 12 tribes of Israel. And the sun and the moon signify Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, and his wife or wives through whom the 12 tribes have come. The woman then is Israel. So in chapter, verse 1, a great sign in heaven, a woman who's clothed with the sun, the moon, under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. And then another sign in heaven, behold, a great red dragon. The red dragon is none other than the evil one. If you go back to verse, up to verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So the dragon is the evil one. Now back to verse 2. And another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems, which is an image of the kingdom that is in existence at the time of the return of Messiah. But the focus that we want to have is the woman who is Israel and the dragon who is the evil one. Then it says, his tail, that is the tail of the dragon, swept down a third of the stars of heaven. So we know that the evil one, according to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, led a rebellion against God. And what John sees is one third of the angelic host joined the evil one in his rebellion against God. Today we know those that joined him, those one-third of the stars, one-third of the angels, as demons, right? They are associates and cohorts of the evil one. Okay, so we have the woman who is Israel. We have the dragon who is the evil one. And now look what happens. It says in verse... Four, and the dragon stood before the woman, Satan, standing before Israel, who is about to give birth, because Israel is the nation through whom the Messiah would come. And notice what he says, and so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So this is a throwback to the first coming of Messiah, right? Messiah is being born. Messiah is coming from the Jewish people. He's coming into the world. And at his first coming, Satan sought to destroy the, the Messiah so that he could not fulfill the redemptive plan that God had that could only occur through Messiah. Is everybody with me? Okay, so Satan is at war with Messiah to prohibit him from fulfilling his redemptive purpose which occurred during his first coming. And now it says, she gave birth to a male child. This is the birth of Messiah. That is the woman, Israel, brought forth or gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was not devoured by the dragon. Rather, Messiah was caught up to God and to his throne. So that's an imagery of his resurrection and ascension. In other words, with respect to Satan's attempt to thwart the redemptive ministry of Messiah, he failed. And Messiah accomplished it and was rewarded for accomplishing it by, being, by having been ascended up into the very presence of God. Everybody with me? Now look what then the text says. And the woman fled. Why? Because as a result of Israel bringing forth Messiah, Satan's then focus of anger and hatred is against the people who brought Messiah into the world in the first place. So she needs to be hid, needs to be protected. Now we can go into more detail with respect to end time issues, but the general point is 
And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Now he throws back into the future. But the whole point is God preserves his people up until the return of Messiah. So Revelation 12 verses 1 to 6 or 1 to 5 is Satan's anger toward Messiah. And because he failed to prohibit Messiah from accomplishing his redemptive ministry, his anger and hatred then is aimed toward the people that brought him forth. So that when you come to chapter 7, uh, verse 7, excuse me, of chapter 12 of Revelation, it says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the evil one, the dragon, and the dragon and his angels... That's the one-third of the stars that his tail drew down earlier in the same ver chapter. Fought back. But notice, he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. Now he tells us who it is. The ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the world. He's thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation the soon coming of the messianic kingdom, the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have come for the accuser of our brothers, he's talking about the antagonism toward the Jewish people, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they've conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the death of Messiah, the redemptive ministry of Messiah. And, and they've conquered him by the blood of Messiah and by the word of their testimony. So the second half of the Revelation 12 chronicles for us Satan's attempt to destroy the woman so as to prohibit the return of Messiah. But he fails, as we just read in those verses. The reason why I bring our attention to this, we raise the question, how is it that Israel has persevered throughout all of this history? And we said the reason they persevered is because God has promised his blessings to come through Abraham and his descendants, Genesis chapter 12. And those nations that will look to Israel and their Messiah will experience the great blessings that God has. Those people or nations that oppose Abraham and his descendants will experience the judgment of God. God's intention is for all peoples to experience his blessing. And Genesis 1 to 11 keeps pointing our attention to where the blessing is going to come through. It's going to come through that channel through whom Adam and then Noah, Genesis chapter 9, blessing. And it finds its fulfillment in Israel, Abraham, and then Deuteronomy. And now we see then why is this their hate, this hatred? Because it's inspired by the evil one who, seek, who has been seeking to destroy God's means of bringing blessing to the world. First, by attempting to prohibit Messiah from providing that redemptive blessing. And then, by attempting to destroy the people through whom Messiah's second coming will occur. Because in Matthew chapter 23, as we made reference, it is Israel that must call out for Messiah's return. You will not see me anymore until you shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until Israel is made whole, Romans eleven twenty five. all Israel shall be saved when the deliverer comes from Zion and turns away all ungodliness from Jacob. So there is a great battle that we can't necessarily see, but we do see the consequences of that battle. Whenever we see hatred toward the Jewish people, whenever we see persecution of the Jewish people, whenever we see opposition, we're seeing the battle being played out before our eyes. And even as those that asked, what irrefutable proof can you give of God's existence? Oh, it's the Jews. And when we look at the Jewish people as irrefutable proof of the existence of God, we also see a battle being waged over her. And the battle's being waged over her so as to impede God's plan of blessing to the ends of the earth, which will come 
at the return of Messiah. Now, I want to just draw our attention to this because as we have now come into 2023, our mission as Beth Ariel is to get the good news out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The battle is being fought over the souls of God's chosen people and other people as well. But with respect to what we're seeing over his chosen people. And we need to enter into that foray by doing the ministry God has called us to do. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who will by faith trust in it for the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we want to do our part in making sure that the good news is brought to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's why we have Joshua Aaron coming. We want to enjoy his presence and his gifts. We want to worship God. But we also want, and that's why in all of the things I send out, this is a perfect opportunity to invite your Jewish friends. We need to always be thinking outwardly. What is it that we are doing that is a means by which the good news could get out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? We want to be ministered to, but we need to be ministering to others. The commission God gave us, Messiah gave us, is to go among all the ethne, all different people groups, make disciples of all of them, teaching them what he has taught them and immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that we're getting the word out. We don't have to have all the answers for everyone. We just need to encourage, to be in prayer for, and to share with those around us, and particularly with making sure our Jewish friends, our neighbors, contacts, people, Jewish people that God puts into our sphere, that we're praying, Lord, is there a way I can share you with my neighbor, my relative, my mailman, my grocer, whoever it is, especially if we know for one reason or another, this is a Jewish man, Jewish woman, Jewish person, Let us be particularly making that effort to pray for them and to share with them. For there is a battle, but there's great blessing if we enter into that battle and share the good news of our Messiah with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So let's pray. Why don't we stand together and we'll pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your marvelous love, grace, and mercy. We thank you for your truths that are embodied in your word. And we're grateful for those like Moses in this case, John as well, whom you have used to make your truths known to us. So we present ourselves before you as your children, as ones in whom your spirit resides. And we pray that he might inflame our hearts to share the good news with others, Jew and non-Jew alike. But for us at Beth Ariel, we're particularly concerned about your Jewish people, Lord. And we need your help always. We need boldness sometimes. We need clarity of thought and ideas. We need creativity. We need the mechanisms by which we might best convey your truths. So help us, Lord, to do that by your mercy and by your grace. For you are our God and you are our King. And Lord, we come this day also to honor you as the redeeming Messiah of Israel, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we are grateful that you have taken away our sin, that you have provided atonement for us. And you have given us an observance to particularly reflect on that truth. You've given us le zikaron for remembrance. You've given us what some call the Lord's Supper, communion. And so, Father, even as we gather this morning, we would partake of these elements that represent your broken body, these elements that represent your atoning sacrifice in our behalf come to give you thanks for what you have done. 
We've come to honor you for what you have given. And we've come to seek your help and to be responsive in obedience to you for who you are. So these thoughts in mind, if anyone uh, ha doesn't have one of our uh, portable communion things, you can just raise your hand and there are folks that are coming. And when they come, we'll open the bottom portion first that has the unleavened bread. Those of you that have it with us, why don't we open it up? And we're reminded that the unleavened bread does not contain yeast. And yeast symbolizes sin in the Bible. Yeshua said, uh, beware of the leaven of the religious leadership of his day that was leading the people astray. In the Hebrew scriptures, no offering, no burnt offerings could be offered with leaven. Paul said, your glorying is not good. Don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven that ye may be unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Wherefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old bread of wickedness and malice, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Really interesting how leaven is used that way. Messiah was unleavened. He was sinless. And because of his sinlessness, he could qualify as one who could bear our sin. Otherwise, he would need someone to bear his sin. But he didn't because he is the spotless lamb of God who could take away our sin and the sin of the whole world. So let's raise the bread and we'll say the blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And let's partake together. And then on the other side, we'll open up the side that has the juice. Remember, Messiah said, I am the true vine. We are branches, and we need to abide in him. And if we abide in him, we will bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit, much more fruit, Messiah says. And that's because he is the one who has given us, given us of his spirit. And that because he gave us of his life. And so let's raise our cups. We'll say the blessing, reminding us that this is the cup of redemption at Passover. When we celebrate Passover, we remember the deliverance from Egypt, the redemption from Egypt. But when we do so, we also remember the redemption and the deliverance we have from our sin because of the redemptive blood of Messiah that cleanses us from all sin. So let's say the blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bore Pari Hagafe. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, Creator of the fruit of the vine. And let's worship Him as we think of what He has done. Yes. 
Lord. Worshippers of God and thereby always be a blessing to who our God and King is. So let's receive the benediction. Adonai <laughs> Panave lecha, the Asem lecha, shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom, his peace. For we ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom. We ask in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Be a blessing. Walk with the King, and you will be a blessing to everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Let's go and join. <laughs>
mañana. Okay.